Say hi. Say hi. Wave hi to the camera. You show him how happy and healthy you are? Yeah! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's see. I'm not going to be in this video because I am a busy toddler who doesn't have time to sit around and do a video with my mom. So, get back here. Say hi! Yeah, you want to read off the thing? Here. Okay, Luke's going to read to you guys what we have to say. Can you read it? You see outside? Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Laura. Welcome if you're new and welcome back if you're returning. I do appreciate you guys coming back to watch some of my videos. Now today's video is different than my usual. As you guys usually know, I do cleaning mom life, DIY, projects around the house, homemaking, that kind of stuff. Today's video is going to be about our experience with Laringo Malaysia. Now for those of you who don't know what Laringo Malaysia is, I will explain it here in a minute. Um, and this video is intended to reach out to all the parents out there who may have just gotten this diagnosis or um, are you know, struggling with it in the middle of it, or, um, you know, just people who have a family member who might have di been diagnosed with it and are just curious about it. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, my son Luke, who is now 17 months old, was diagnosed with laryngomalacia when he was six weeks old. Um, so laryngomalacia, and if you guys see me um, looking down, I have some notes here that I'm just going to kind of go through. Um, but laryngomalacia is basically when the tissue of the larynx softens and becomes floppy. The larynx is the tissue right above the vocal cords. Um, and if I can find a picture, I will insert a picture of what it normally looks like here versus what it looks like in babies who are diagnosed with laryngomalacia. So when that area of the tissue becomes soft or floppy, you can have symptoms like noisy breathing, which they call strider. Um, you can have feeding problems, usually um, reflux is a big sign, or um, choking while feeding, um, feeding aversions, bottle aversions, nipple aversions, um, things like that. Um, they can have poor weight gain because they are using so much of their energy to breathe because that little, um, the, the extra floppy skin is kind of making that windpipe smaller and then they're struggling to breathe more. So a lot of their energy goes to breathing. So even when they're eating good, um, they still have trouble gaining weight. Um, they have, sometimes they can have apnea, which is like breathing pauses. Um, they can have blue spells. Um, or like I said before the reflux and it could be really severe or to the point where they could be um, needing a feeding tube or um, need thickening of their formula or breast milk or whatever they're eating. So laryngomalacia varies in severity. There could be mild, moderate, and severe. Um, Mild to moderate is usually just strider, which is noisy breathing, some reflux, um, feeding issues, poor weight gain, and then severe can be like blue spells, like stop, they stop breathing for a long period of time. Um, you could get it, you know, you could bring them into the hospital and their oxygen saturation could be low. And all laryngomalacia babies, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, do have problems um, fighting respiratory infections more so than normal kids. So that's kind of the issues that you face when you get this diagnosis. Um, laryngomalacia usually lasts up until about two years old, but I have heard of it lasting longer and I've also heard of it um, being shorter, but I think two is usually the most common. And that is usually because they have grown up a little bit more. They That whole area, um, the muscles around the neck and the tissues have kind of 
grown and expanded and that that windpipe is just a little bit bigger um, so you know they just they don't have any of the symptoms related to the narrowing of that area if that makes sense um, the treatments so if you're mild to moderate and you're gaining weight and you're not having any um, respiratory issues they usually monitor you and just um, manage the symptoms so for example they may put the baby on some kind of reflux medicine to help with um, like they're still going to have reflux but at least what they can do is give them reflux medicine to decrease the amount of acid that's in that spit up so they're not constantly um, burning their esophagus like their little um, you know the, where they where they eat and they throw up sorry that didn't really make sense okay so the acid reflux meds are given to reduce the amount of acid that's in their stomach so that when they do throw up it doesn't burn their throat constantly over and over okay they will monitor weight gain um, if the baby is having trouble gaining weight your doctor can suggest different um, ways for weight gain um, they can put you on a certain kind of formula or they can um, give a put like a powder in the breast milk to increase the uh, calories um, also manage the feeding difficulties like you may need to see a feeding therapist or um, get you know baby in certain position and I'm gonna go into that a little bit more with my experience in Luke um, and um, basically they just monitor the baby for worsening symptoms so they make sure it doesn't become severe now severe cases um, they will do all of what I mentioned before, and if it comes to it, they may do um, a surgery called a supraglottoplasty. And basically, they go in and they cut that um, that skin fold where it's soft and floppy, and so that the baby can breathe better and hopefully the symptoms resolve. I've heard of a lot of um, cases uh, where it didn't help and then a lot of cases where it did um, and I've also heard them having to do it multiple times <sighs> thank the Lord I did we did not have to do that with Luke but we were very close to having to do that um, because he was having so much trouble gaining weight um, but like I said I'm gonna go into Luke's story after I get started but this intro is just to kind of explain what it is and um, if you guys are going on Google and all the things it can be really scary all the all the stuff that they mention um, can be a little intimidating so this is just to kind of put it in layman's terms and just kind of uh, give you the basics okay so now I'm gonna go into Luke's story with Laringo Malaysia um, my son Luke is like I mentioned before he's 17 months old and he's doing awesome he's great he's in really good health um, he's perfectly normal um, We've been discharged from the ENT at this point, um, and the ENT doctor is the ear, nose, throat doctor, and that's the one who will diagnose, um, will give you the diagnosis of laryngomalacia. They're the ones who kind of um, go in with a scope and, de you know, determine whether or not it is laryngomalacia. And I'll, rather than say the whole word, laryngomalacia, I will uh, refer to it as LM. A lot of times it's just an abbreviation so if you guys hear me say that that's what I'm referring to okay so Luke was born September 20th 2019 he was um, 39 weeks and perfectly normal birth no issues um, he came out having some noisy breathing the nurses thought he needed to be suctioned a bunch like that he had a bunch of fluid left over from the birth um, so he was constantly being suctioned in the beginning. They were just kept. They just kept hearing like this congestion, so they assumed it was um, just extra fluid. So they were suctioning him a lot. I remember uh, the first night we were in the hospital. The nurse um, got the doctor to um, give her some Afrin, which is like basically um, a nasal decongestant, um, and they were just monitoring the congestion. We also had a pediatrician. Um, come in and I noticed so I'm an RN for those of you who don't know and I have worked in pediatrics for a while as well and um, I have taken care of a lot of laryngomalacia babies um, obviously like I'm a first-time mom so I never had one of my own but I have taken care of them before and I know it's noisy breathing um, it they usually outgrow it. like I knew these basic things like they 
it's not much you can do for it. You just monitor it. Um, they have trouble fighting infections, things like that. But when I heard it, when I heard Luke breathing, I thought it was laryngomalacia or tracheomalacia, I, which is another form. It's just in the trachea rather than the larynx. But anyway, um, I thought it was one of those. And I even mentioned it to the, the lactation nurse who had seen us while we were in the hospital. And they said, oh no, uh, he's just a noisy breather. That's all they said. They just kept saying he's a noisy breather. And we even had a second pediatrician come in and check on him and they said, he's just a noisy breather. So I thought I was just being a, a nurse and being like overthinking it and just saying like, oh yeah, maybe I'm just, I'm sleep deprived. I don't know what I'm talking about. I know too much. I've, you know, being a nurse, it's kind of like, you know a lot of health stuff, so you automatically assume the worst or you assume certain things that it may not be. So um, I just was brushing it off and I was like, okay, he's just a noisy breather, whatever that means. All right. <laughs> So, um, basically I should have listened to my mom gut. I should have, um, responded to that feeling of just knowing that something's off. Um, I was, like I mentioned before, I was sleep deprived. The hormones were running through me. I was, you know, crazy. I just wanted to get out of there. They even made us stay an extra night in the hospital to monitor the congestion, which then they ended up saying it's just noisy breathing. So, I don't know, I just, looking back, I just wish I would have um, spoken up a little bit more and just advocated more, but um, I did learn my lesson sooner rather than later, and the rest of our journey was smooth sailing because I did advocate for him, but I'll get into that here in a little bit. So about um, two weeks being at home, Luke was um, eating fine, sleeping good, you know, relatively for a newborn, and um, uh, he, then, he then started to develop severe reflux, like projectile vomiting reflux. And um, I knew all babies spit up, like that's just totally normal, you know, whatever. But then there started to be a lot. Um, so I thought it was maybe like something I was eating or, you know, way he was positioned or whatever. So we tried different things. Um, it didn't work. And then my milk supply started going down. Like he wasn't like my milk supply was going down because maybe he wasn't getting enough milk. So I started pumping and I noticed I wasn't hardly getting any milk out. So then I decided um, to see the pediatrician, one for the reflux, but also just to like see what his weight gain was. Um, and it was like in between, you know, his well baby visits. So I called the pediatrician, we went in, um, she put him on Zantac, uh, a reflux med, um, which now we know Zantec is not good, so, but at that time it was fine, so we were on that, but we weren't on that for very long. But anyway, um, but at that appointment, the doctor noticed that his weight gain from his last appointment was almost nothing. He didn't really gain weight in that, like, week that we had been since we last saw the pediatrician. So she was pretty concerned about that. So she said, well, let's go ahead and, um, let's go ahead and make an appointment to see the lactation nurse. So I said, okay, that's a great idea because even though the, the lactation nurse that saw us in the hospital seemed like he was latching fine and he was doing fine, let's just double check. So we went in to see the lactation nurse and the lactation nurse took one look at him while he was feeding and he was like struggling to breathe. Like he was having what we call retractions basically um, and I'll insert a picture of it if I can here, but it's like when the ribs, you can see the ribs, um, the baby's ribs when they're breathing, they're because they're struggling so hard to breathe. Their belly is like sucking in, trying to get air. Um, so he was having a lot of those, uh, which is a big red flag. Um, that's what happens before they have apnea spells or um, breathing pauses. So she was the one who was saying, you know, it really looks like laryngomalacia. So we went back to the pediatrician and then she gave us a referral to an ENT, ear, nose, throat doctor. Um, here in Atlanta, we have um, a pediatric ENT group that are really amazing. Um, they, they took really good care of us and um, they got us in to see them pretty quickly. Uh, the pediatrician also wanted to rule out any cardiac or any um, stomach issues. 
So in addition to seeing the ENT, we also went to see a cardiologist and a GI doctor, just to make sure we were covering all of our bases. Our pediatrician was really on top of it. Even though she's a general pediatrician, she, can't, she doesn't specialize in these certain things, she wanted to make sure she wasn't missing anything. So we first went to see the cardiologist. Um, the cardiologist did a full echo, uh, echocardiogram, and they did a EKG. Um, they did um, labs. They did. I'm trying to remember what else they did. It's so long ago now. They did all kinds of tests, and his heart was absolutely fine. Thank goodness, because that was one of my biggest worries. Um, then we went to see the ENT doctor, that appointment was next, and that's when he was diagnosed with the laryngomalacia. They diagnosed it by going in with a camera, looking down his throat, and determining if they, you know, if the, the larynx looked like a typical laryngomalacia case. And of course it did. He did get diagnosed with moderate laryngomalacia which it was like borderline severe, so we just had to closely monitor him. Um, he was also diagnosed with a tongue tie at that appointment, so that same day they clipped his tongue tie thinking that may have been a reason why he was having trouble eating or nursing as well, so um, he got that done. That was really simple and easy, um, and then he put him on a different type of uh, reflux med, a little bit stronger than Zantac, Side note, the doctor didn't know about which um, formulary to order, so he ordered some kind of, it was a meprazole in a powder form, and it ended up costing us like $200, and we had no idea that like, um, like we thought that we had to take this very specific one. But looking back, we should ask more questions, and um, <laughs> then we saw the GI doctor, and the GI doctor was like, no, there's no reason for you to be on the $200 powder. You, you can put him on the disintegrating tablet, and that's the same thing. So that's what we went ahead and did. So we were put on the, the omeprazole disintegrating tablet, which for us worked best. Um, and then I started to really get anxious because going back to the ENT, the ENT was saying, you know, it's moderate. Uh, we need to monitor it. If he doesn't gain weight, we're going to have to do the surgery. And that really scared me. Um, I know that there's a really good outcome for the surgeries and all of that, but I just didn't want my baby to have surgery. So um, that's when I started to become really anxious, really scared, really worried. Um, I was only six weeks postpartum at this point, so the hormones were so crazy. I was still dealing with a little bit of like postpartum depression and anxiety. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, all this, this diagnosis and, you know, you just want your baby to be normal uh, and he'll live a happy, healthy life. That's all you want for your kid. And at this point, it was, it was just scary. Um, even for an RN, as my, like myself, I just felt like, like I've taken care of so many sick people in my life that I didn't want to, I didn't want to have a sick baby at home too. But I soon realized that um, there was a reason why Luke had this diagnosis. Um, I do feel like God gave me this boy because he knew that I could take care of him. Me and my husband could do this. We were strong. Um, and looking back, it made us all stronger. <sighs> I'm trying not to get emotional. Um, but we... Um, So then I decided, you know, it's time for me to step it up. I need to um, be strong for him, be strong for my family, and I started looking for more support. <clears throat> I, uh, my mom mentioned there was a Facebook group for parents with um, laryngomalacia. Uh, I found two of them that were really, really helpful. I will leave them linked down below um, if you guys are interested in joining those Facebook groups. They are really amazing. Um, there's a lot of moms and dads on there that um, are right in the thick of it. Um, I will say for, for us, it was, with Luke's case being mild, um, and there's a lot of other kids out there who was much more severe, seeing all of that, it scared me a little bit. So sometimes it can be a little overwhelming on there because there's so much information, there's so much um, other cases that are worse off, and you just feel like, oh my God, that could be my baby 
Um, so that can be a little bit overwhelming, but there are a lot of um, positive things about the group. There are a lot of people just going through the same thing and you are welcome to post about it and just vent or if you have questions. Um, there was uh, at one point um, a mom was saying how um, thickening the baby's formula or breast milk really helped. Um, so that was one thing that I did. So we were on the omeprazole and we bought, uh, we went through a couple of different thickeners. We tried um, thickening with just um, oatmeal cereal, like baby cereal, and thickening with rice cereal. And then we ended up going, he had some stomach issues with those, um, so we ended up just doing um, thickener, gel thickener. And I'll leave a link to that down below if you guys need it. Um, it is a little bit expensive, but it works and it add, it actually had a little bit of calories to it so it actually helped increase the calories of my breast milk so at this point I was exclusively pumping um, the nursing just didn't work out he was struggling to breathe too much um, bottles were easier for him um, and he was getting more milk at a time we and we could monitor how much he was getting which was important to us because when you're just breastfeeding you're not even quite sure how much they got so um, for us that just worked out um, and exclusively pumping was a struggle um, I did it for about seven months and then I just I couldn't do it anymore but that was my goal I wanted to give him the first six months of his life um, as much breast milk as I could give him uh, my supply wasn't that great because I was exclusively pumping and we all know that like the pump doesn't get out as much milk as if your baby was just to nurse so my struggles with breast milk or breastfeeding was just a little it was a lot but i'm not going to get into all that that was that was a lot um so anyway so i know i'm kind of all over the place right now i just i do want this video to be um straightforward to the point um i know you guys that are looking for this video that may have searched for um, you know support of a baby with laryngomalacia are just probably looking for a quick video to get information So that's kind of what I want to what I want to do um, So the next part I'm going to talk about is our treatment plan for Luke. So Basically the two things we were doing are monitoring and managing symptoms. So we're monitoring his weight gain monitoring him his breathing um, managing his reflux um, managing the weight gain so um, Thank goodness Luke did not have any blue spells or anything like that. He just had the really loud strider. Um, and, you know, if you heard it, you would think you would just hear like almost like he was congested. Um, and you just had that all the time. And when he was sleeping, it was like he was like snoring. We just monitored that. Everything was fine. As soon as he was like three months old, he was able to turn himself over. We took him out of the swaddle and he actually laid on his belly. And I know that that's not the best practice but he put himself there and in fact it actually helped with his strider i even consulted the doctor about it and they said just let him do it uh, most lm babies sleep better on their stomachs so that's what we did we were managing the reflux with the omeprazole and managing the reflux with thickening the breast milk so we would put that gel thickener um, in the breast milk that i would pump and put it through and put it in a bottle with a nipple size that was like a little bit bigger than his um, what he would usually be taking at his age just so that the thickened breast milk would get to him quicker and then another thing I learned from the um, Facebook group was a side lying position was best for laryngomalacia babies so when you're nursing you're laying them on their side so I thought okay well why don't I do that while I bottle feed him so I had him in this like very specific position. If I have a picture of him feeding this position, I'll insert it here. Um, but it was like very specific. We had to prop him up, um, lay him on his side, and that would be like the only way he would take a bottle. And then we would do like small frequent feeds. Um, so he was on like every two hour feedings for a very long time, which I know that that's kind of like newborn phase, but he was doing that until probably about four or five months old. So those are the things that worked for us. Like I said, managing the reflux, um, monitoring his weight gain, monitoring his breathing issues. Um, and then at four months old, he started to set up a little bit better and that was when our pediatrician gave us the okay to introduce solid foods. And solid foods were a game changer for him because 
it actually helped keep the breast milk um, down so we would feed him a bottle and then immediately give him some solids and that kind of kept the liquids you know thicker and kind of weighed it down a little bit uh, making it um, more difficult to spit it back up so it did help a lot he still spat spit up here and there but um, overall it helped therefore it helped him gain weight um, we gave him like things like peanut butter right away uh, things that were in high in calories you know we slowly introduced them but as soon as we could we did and that was a game changer uh, he really enjoyed it um, and sitting in his little chair kind of propped up with support after he'd eat that helped a lot to kind of help gravity just keep everything down um, so I think that's when things started to change uh, as far as him gaining weight and he was sleeping through the night more and he was just more comfortable he was turning onto his belly at that point so he was comfort more comfortable sleeping um, I became a little bit less worried because he was gaining weight appropriately. Um, he was meeting all of his milestones. He was um, happy and, you know, he was just a happy, healthy kid. Um, around that time, though, too, my milk supply started to drop off. So we did have to supplement with a little bit of formula. That was an entire process because of the reflux. Um, we tried a bunch of different formulas um, and... I know that that's hard for many moms who are trying to uh, introduce formula, trying to find the right one, but I would just suggest looking around. Um, I We ended up uh, liking the Enfamil Gentle Ease. That was what worked best, and we still use a thickener at this point. We didn't wean him off of the thickener until about six months old. Um, so he was getting thickened breast milk, uh, thickened formula, um, and solid foods at this point. So. The combo of all of those, plus his omeprazole, um, really helped with his reflux and weight gain. So the updates I have now, now that he's 17 months old, he still has his strider. It is very prominent still. Um, it's, it seems like the cold weather aggravates it when he's running, when he's playing hard. It seems to be its loudest. Um, he did just get over a cold last week, and it was loud when he had that. Um, I will say that when he was a little baby, I was obsessed with him not getting sick. Um, I was just a freak about germs and not letting him get sick. Now that he's older, he can handle colds with no problem, just like a normal baby would. But in the beginning, I just knew that with an laryngomalacia baby um, and a respiratory infection, it was a recipe for disaster. So I was absolutely uh, obsessed with keeping all germs out of the house. Um, so he didn't get sick until he was probably about 10 months old um, he's had a couple of viruses since then but he's been fine and um, he eats well to an extent um, so he still has feeding aversions um, he is very difficult to feed um, he can take uh, regular milk out of a sippy cup and does totally fine with that he's on whole milk um, it seems like straws are usually his best friend he can't really sip um, out of a cup yet but um, he has like a sippy cup with a straw in it and he seems to do really well with that. And that was another thing too with laryngomalacia babies, um, different types of bottles. Um, they're very particular on how they can take a bottle and what nipple size and um, so you just have to, it's just trial and error. I think we tried like seven different bottles. The ones that worked for us were the Avent Natural um, bottles with the nipples. Um, and those worked best. And like I said, I would just go up a nipple size if I was thickening the breast milk. Um, and then since he turned one, he's on a sippy cup now with whole milk and he does absolutely fine with that. It's not thickened or anything. Um, but food is an issue. Um, he's a very picky, picky toddler. Um, textures bother him, certain textures. He has to have small bites. Um, he does not have a big appetite. Getting him to eat is a struggle. Um, and I, I do think that it stems from when he was a little baby and not wanting to eat um, just because of the reflux and how painful it was for him. And um, I, do, I do genuinely believe that that's why he still has a feeding aversion. Um, but we're working through it. Uh, we give him high calorie foods um, and just, you know, he doesn't eat as much. And we're just come to terms with it. He's gaining weight adequately. He's healthy. He's happy. So... We're trying not to be too worried, but we're just taking it day by day. And that's 
really all you can do. Um, when you get this diagnosis, you want to try everything, you want to do everything, you want to try and plan out all the things you're going to try, but you would just have to um, try new things and take it day by day. And that leads me into my next topic, which is advice to parents that have received this diagnosis. Um, listen to your gut. Listen to your mom gut. Listen to your dad gut. If something is telling you that something's off, listen to that. Um, follow up with your doctor. Uh, lean on your support system. If you um, have a partner or somebody to help you take care of your baby, make sure you're leaning on that. Leaning on your family. Take a break. Um, take a break when you need it because these babies are, they have a lot of issues and you're going to be stressed out and you're going to be very tired um, and you're going to be racking your brain constantly on what to do and you need to take a break. You need to take care of yourself. You know, they, they, they say you can't pour from an empty glass. It is absolutely true. And I'm not saying that I was good at this because it's definitely easier said than done. I didn't want to leave anybody else with my baby. Um, I didn't want to trust anybody else. I felt like me and my husband were the only ones who could feed him properly. And um, looking back, you know, I, I, did, I needed to let go more. Um, and that would be my advice. Just let go a little bit, do what you can, um, and that's all you can do. Be flexible, be willing to try new things. When something doesn't work, don't keep forcing it. Just try something new, try a different way, give it a break. I do suggest joining some kind of support group, whether it's a Facebook group or something in your community that you can um, you know, find support, um, leaning on your support system, uh, your family, those people around you, um, constantly asking for advice or asking questions, seeking more information, doing your research. Um, I would not recommend getting on Google too much because all of that can be really overwhelming. Um, but just seeking out genuine support from either whether it's a medical provider or um, you know just somebody in your community that may know more or you know that brings me to another point too like if you guys are dealing with this it's new for you um, and you want to chat leave me a comment I would love to get to know you I would love to try and help if I can um, I know when I was going through this just hearing other people's stories um, was really really helpful so let me know in the comments below if you guys re recently received this diagnosis or if you're in the thick of it or if you've had this before and how you dealt with it just let me know I'd love to chat with you guys and that's all I have for you guys for today's video I do hope that it was helpful um, and if you guys have any questions or anything that you want to talk about in the comments feel free to leave them. I can also leave my email down in the description box below if you guys want to send me like a private email. I'm totally fine with that too. Um, and yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful day and uh, my thoughts and prayers are with those of you who are dealing with this diagnosis because I know it's really hard. This one's a struggle because it is, there's a lot of information about so many other illnesses out there and this one is just, there's not a lot out there even though um, it's not it's not super rare but it's not super common um, it's just kind of one of those things that you know oh kids grow out of it kids grow out of it but for that time being when they haven't grown out of it it's a struggle um, and um, it shouldn't be taken lightly it is serious and um, it's hard it's hard to deal with so I hope that this video has reached those of you who needed it today I hope you guys all have a wonderful day and I'll see you guys in the next video.